Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Canada C3 Hangout. This is our seventh Hangout uh, from the Canada C3. For those who don't know, the Canada C3 is a Canada 150 signature project. So a few months ago, the C3 vessel left from Toronto, made its way down St. Lawrence, around through the Maritimes, and it's now up in the area around Nunavut. And we're very lucky to be joining them today uh, to talk to a couple scientists on board. So first, we're going to meet uh, Dr. Mark Graham. He's a Vice President of Research and Collections at the Canadian Museum of Nature. He's worked in the museum community for the past 29 years, starting off at the Vancouver Aquarium, uh, up to now where he's at the Museum of Nature. As a researcher, he's explored marine environments on all three coasts of Canada. And now much of his time is spent strategizing and planning for better conservation uh, of the biological diversity that we have. So Mark, uh, it's great to be connecting with you live today from C3. And it's it's great to be with you guys. I'll tell you, uh, I went to sleep last night, and I was in Labrador uh, in a on a ship sailing past Labrador. And when I woke up this morning, I was on the south coast of Baffin Island. Uh, and so we're on this uh, wonderful ship called the Polar Prince. And uh, I'm inside a two one of the two laboratories on the ship. This one is a we call it the Canadensis Lab. It's shaped like a giant tin can, but it's a fabulous lab that's uh, provided to us by Dalhousie University, their uh, Ocean uh, Frontiers Network. <clears throat> and it, uh, it's a great place for us to uh, prepare all of our samples for the scientists who are back home waiting for us to, uh, to, to bring them samples. We have 23 projects, science projects, that we're working on during this voyage. And uh, a lot of that work is looking at all of the living diversity in the ocean and uh, along the coast of the ocean of our journey. And so our small team of four scientists, we have four scientists on every leg of the journey. Uh, we go out into a research boat and we take water samples from the ocean and we take underwater sound recordings to listen to the noises that the water is making, that the animals uh, in the ocean are making, and the noises that people are making in the ocean. Uh, with the water sample, we are looking at pretty basic ocean chemistry uh, that tells us a lot about the ocean. Things like uh, the pH, uh, the, uh, the, the salinity, how salty it is, the temperature, and how deep it is we're working in. We also look at chlorophyll levels, which tells us how many uh, plants are living in the water, microscopic plants, the algae uh, that's in the water. So we're doing many of these chemistry readings, we're taking samples of the water, uh, and we're also taking samples of the animals that live in the water. So the plankton, the zooplankton, things like crustaceans and arrowworms uh, and mollusks, all kinds of different things that we catch in a plankton net that we put down to the bottom of the ocean and we drag it right up to the surface to see uh, everything that, that, that is in the water column. That's what happens in the research boat. We send another team to land where they are looking at all of the plants that live on the land next to the ocean. We're looking at the animals that live right beside uh, uh, where the water comes to, to the shore, so the intertidal area. We are also looking at um, uh, water from the rivers that go into the ocean to characterize uh, and to measure the, the chemistry of those rivers. So there's there's a lot, a lot going on on the land and uh, at sampling in the ocean for these 23 projects. So Mark, I believe that this is leg number six right now? That's right. All right, so the Canada C3 is a 15 leg journey, each leg being 10 days over 150 days, and will eventually end off uh, in British Columbia. So how many legs of the journey are you gonna be on the ship for? I'm very lucky, I get to be on seven legs of this journey. So I've uh, just done two so far, and we're entering into uh, the Arctic area of this journey. Uh, uh, tomorrow morning we'll be in Iqaluit, which is on the southern part of Baffin Island. Uh, and we will grab a, another crew of, of people will come on board, and, and the ones that are on now will, will leave us. And so uh, we'll start another 10 days with, with other people. 
Um, I have to tell you, we, we just came through uh, Labrador in the last few days, uh, and the coast of Labrador is, is, is very, very remote. A lot of people don't get to go there. And there are, there's a mountain range, mountains, uh, and a lot of the waterways that go into the coast are very steep walled fjords. Uh, they're very, very beautiful places to visit. Uh, and and the, there's a rich, rich, rich biodiversity living in the water and on the lands all around there. And, and a lot of that northern part is the Torn Gap Mountains National Park, one of Canada's newer national parks. Very beautiful place to visit. So I know the Arctic's a remote region. Um, in what way does the C3 project allow you to do, and the other sciences, to do some research that they might not have been able to do otherwise? So this ship is a floating platform with two labs, laboratories on board, and lots of capacity to take samples. And the, it's, it's a part of uh, the, the close to the coastline and going all the way around Canada, all in, all in 150 days in one time, allows us to take samples on all the parts of Canada and gives a very good comparison um, at this one at this one year, this one, the same 150 days. So one sample series, so we can compare all the different regions of Canada. But it also allows us to take samples in places where people have been before in previous years, and to compare what we're finding to to what they have found. That comparison is really important right now. Uh, as environmental conditions change rapidly in, in the world, they change most rapidly in the polar regions like Canada's Arctic. And so the results we get from this voyage will be very useful in comparing with what scientists found, say, 10 years ago. So these are, these are great reference points for scientists to have. Okay, so just before we, we went live, we... Um uh, Peter talked a little bit about the sea ice uh, that you've come into. Are you able to pop outside quickly and give us a little look at what you're sailing through at the moment? We can take a little look outside. It's pretty interesting when you're on an icebreaker. Uh, you, you have to be careful for icebergs, but the kind of ice we're going through right now, we just plow right through it. It's, it's really interesting. So I'm just stepping outside the lab right now, and I'm going to point the computer... It's kind of foggy out there. I don't know if you can see the ice. But there's pieces of ice floating past the ship. Hang on, here comes some more. And it, pretty much as far as you can see, there's ice like that floating back past the ship. So I know Did a you big... See that? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I know uh, a full... Yeah, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I was just going to mention that uh, that sea ice, uh, that's ice from last winter probably, much of that is just breaking up and, and starting to float away. Uh, so even though it's nice and warm where you guys are, uh, that ice is, is all around us. It's about zero degrees outside right now uh, and, and when we're in that ice. Okay. And are you in a region now where it's possible you might see some polar bears? So that's that's the reason why we're we're staying close because uh, it, and it, it wasn't very thick right there, but uh, much of what we've been going through today is that ice is packed together and we're just crunching through it because there are polar bears uh, out there. That's what they do at this time of the year. They go out onto that ice and they hunt for seals, and so we're we're just trying to observe as much of the the wildlife as possible. Uh, we've also been doing um, bird surveys off the deck of the ship uh, this afternoon. So each we're counting how many birds and the kinds of birds that are flying past the ship. Excellent. Our next hangout coming out up uh, next week will be at 1.30 uh, p.m. Eastern, and we will talk to the scientist who's uh, leading the that bird survey. So that'll be exciting to... Uh, I just lost you there for a moment, but there there are lots of birds uh, flying past. This is a, a very active Here, time. Here a little bit about summer. what's happening.
Sure. There, there are lots of seabirds around right now. This is uh, so of, and many species of seabirds have flown up here to to have their young and uh, and to reproduce. All right. So it sounds like it's a good time to be spotting them. Yeah, you'll have fun talking to Grant Gilchrist uh, in your next your next Google Hangout. Perfect. Well, before we see if there's some questions, Mark, um, I wanted to ask you, when I was on the ship in Toronto, uh, in the lab, so just visualizing the lab for those watching, it's basically a, almost a, a cargo container right on the ship near the bow, green, and I saw a really neat piece of technology um, that was going to be used to collect the samples, um, run them through a filter, and then you could have kind of the DNA that can be used. You talk a little bit about that uh, activity. Sure. There, there. Just behind me, there's a, a fancy pump. It's called a peristaltic pump, which uh, pushes water through very specialized, very very fine filters, which catches just even the smallest molecules on it. And so we're able to sample the water and all the DNA that's shed from all the animals in the water, including bacteria and viruses. Are, are caught in the filter. And then later, scientists in their labs uh, can use what's called high throughput sequencing to look at all the different genomes that are in the water, which means uh, all, the, all the different species that, are, that occur in these waters will have, have a different genome. And so they will be able to tell us uh, how many different species gen uh, genetic material we found in the water. It's a, it's a relatively new way to look at the diversity of life in different habitats. And so we, we're sampling seawater for people to tell us uh, the, the range, the diversity of animals that are in the, in the water that we're sailing over. At the same time, we are using plankton nets to sample uh, the animals that are in the water so they can have a comparison. They can, they can actually see the animals that are living in the water um, that they're sampling. All right. Well, Mark, are you up for a couple questions? Sure, let's have them. All right. Well, let's jump to our first group. So we have, and feel free to cheer when I announce uh, your group in Victoria, er, sorry, Vancouver, British Columbia, Science World. Uh, their mission, there they are. Their yeah, mission, science world. yeah, their mission is to engage British Columbians in science and inspire fun. Uh, future science and technology leadership throughout the province. Um, today, the Generation Innovation is a summer camp for curious-minded uh, students aged 13 to 15 are excited to be joining uh, the Hangout today. So how's everybody doing? Good. So it must be a little earlier for you guys. What time is it there? Like 11 o'clock? Yeah. All right. Excellent. So do you guys have any questions for Mark about the Arctic, about Canada C3, what he's up to on the ship? Come on up nice and close so we can hear you loud. <laughs> How do you study and observe the animals without well, disturbing them and uh, without making it unnatural, harming them. Yeah, I forgot the word. Okay, so I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, yesterday, we saw a polar bear, and so we observed the polar bear. We we got uh, within a safe range of the polar bear, but not too close. The polar bear was on land. And we were in uh, a zodiac, and so uh, we were, which is a boat on the on the water. And so we were, we were taking photographs and keeping a safe distance away. So we, we didn't harm the polar bear. Um, the other animals that we are sampling, um, these are they're called invertebrates. They're animals that don't have a backbone. Crustaceans. They're mollusks. Um, uh, they're, they're animals that are free floating, like they're plankton in the ocean. So those we are keeping. We actually take them and we preserve them in alcohol and we bring them back to the lab so that people can identify them uh, and use them uh, uh, to, to study. So those are actually harmed. They're, 
they're dead when we have them. We preserve them and we bring them back to the lab. Uh, so those ones, uh, you know, don't get away. We bring them back to the lab. Yeah, there's another question there. Um, can you tell us about like, um, I, I remember we did like all kinds of like larger um, invertebrates. I mean, can you tell us about them, especially the giant I just need you to get a little closer to the microphone, please. I can't really hear you. Um, can you tell us about like the, <laughs> sorry, about like the underwater invertebrates and that kind of stuff? Sure. I, 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 sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the everything that that lives in the water here is adapted to live in really cold environments. And so the, the kind of species that, that live in the Arctic um, are going to be a little different than the ones that live uh, in, in uh, the ocean that's further south. So they can tolerate water temperatures that are anywhere from minus 1.5 degrees centigrade to plus 2 or plus 3. So they're, they're adapted to, to live in those kinds of temperatures. So if you were, if you've got your scuba gear on and you drop down to 100 feet, you would see things uh, you, on the bottom of the ocean. You would see a lot of sea stars, things that are called brittle stars. Uh, so there's lots of them on the bottom. There's lots of other kinds of sea stars down there as well. There are things like soft coral. So um, there are species of soft coral that, that puff up. They look like um, uh, big spongy, um, uh, <laughs> big sponges that are red. Uh, so there, there are corals down there. Um, there are lots of um, isopods and amphipods, which are kinds of crustaceans. Um, so that there's, a, there's a rich life on the bottom that's deep down. As you swim up a little shallower, you start to see um, seaweed or kelp. So lots of big kelp that, that uh, is in areas where the sunlight gets down a bit further. And then as you get closer to the water's edge, there's less and less there because the ice scours the edge of the ocean during the winter time. So a lot of the normal things that you would see in the top maybe uh, five or ten feet of the ocean are, aren't going to be so plentiful because uh, the ice is pretty hard on those uh, sea edges uh, during the winter time. Um, okay. Also on the bottom, I should mention, also on the bottom of the ocean, there's all kinds of uh, clams that live in the inside the sediments of the ocean. And also um, things like sea urchin, sea cucumbers, and tunicates, the, lots of diversity down there. Um, could you tell me more about the isopods, please? The isopods. Uh, one of my favorite of all lives in the Arctic. Taurus baffini. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a big, long about that long and young all the, the young it's two antennae look like middles she might have about a hundred of them on the antenna and she holds her antenna up so that all the sediments and food that's flowing through the ocean are caught by the by the babies on her antenna it's it's the neatest thing to see that's my favorite ice club there are other ones that look you know like strange star trek creatures uh they're flattened and they walk on the bottom of the ocean and they're yellow in color um, with all the legs underneath them and they're they're also large size about that big all right those sound like some great questions um i'm gonna pop over to our group so we have a group today at um with Mara Baus at the, from the education team at a C3 Hub Museum at the Canadian Museum of Nature. Now I know people are kind of walking in and out and sitting and, and taking in a little bit. I'll just check in and see if there's any questions uh, from the museum for Mark. Hello, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Okay. We had a crowd, Hi. but they're, they're busy. So the crowd just dispersed right when you went over here. <laughs> Hello, water gallery. There's, there's Miriam. 
But do you know what we've been doing for the last month? We've been collecting questions on our question board. So I'm Perfect. Sure, I'm sure our friends in Vancouver and anyone else who's connected wants to hear a couple top questions <laughs> from visitors to the C3 Hub. A reoccurring question is, how do fish sleep and do fish hibernate? Everyone wants to know about fish. Do you want to do a, a sleeping, hibernating? We're so curious. <laughs> well, I don't think I've ever had that question before. Uh, you did? Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that fish do not sleep. There are some times when they're more active than others. Um, I know um, there, there is a particular in, in Newfoundland, it's called the cunner, uh, and it's an inshore fish, and uh, when it gets colder, it, it goes dormant, and so it gets very inactive, and you can, you can often see them just leaning against a rock uh, under, if you're scuba diving in cold at cold times of the year, but yeah, I, I don't, I, we, we can't see that they really, they don't sleep. So, so hibernating? Like, like I said to the last group, um, all the, the animals that are in the Arctic, um, they're adapted to live in the cold. And so even though it's really super cold, they, they, they can still remain active at all times of the year. Excellent. Uh, another question. Have you ever seen a blue whale? Um, I, I, have, I personally have seen a blue whale. Um, not on this trip, the group that was in leg two, uh, which was uh, from Montreal to, to Bay Como, uh, they were going past uh, Tadoussac, and I'm sure they had a chance to see a blue whale uh, in that area of Canada. Excellent, and this is a really good one. Is it cool to be a scientist? It is so cool to be a scientist, I can't even begin to describe it to you. Uh, I mean, I've been a scientist for all of my adult life, uh, and and it has brought me to many parts of Canada and around the world to study things. Uh, you meet interesting people. You get to be on uh, um, uh, Google Hangouts and, and talk to people all over the place. Uh, so, yeah, it, being a scientist has, gives you so many possibilities to do great things. Thank you. Is there anyone in the water gallery who wants to ask the question? I can't turn it on if don't. No, everyone's being shy. You know, it's Friday afternoon. The weather's beautiful. We have like robot dragons downtown. Mark, do you know about the robot dragon and the spider? Like the La Machine is here. I, I, I've heard. Yes. It's setting a day in Ottawa. Anything else? Should we go back? Do you want me to keep asking my questions or? Uh, let's, uh, let's meet our next scientist. All right, perfect. All right, thank you very much for the questions. Those are good questions from the question board. Um, all right, Mark, well, thank you so much, but stick around because maybe some of the questions towards the end, you might be able to jump in again. But uh, okay. if, um, if Nathalie's handy, uh, let's introduce her and let her talk a little bit about her time on the C3. Okay, you guys, thanks, bye-bye. All right, thank you. So I just want to introduce uh, Nathalie, La Francois, she's a researcher at the Live Collections and Research Division of the Biodome uh, in Montreal. Her research focuses on cold water fish conservation, their physiology, as well as uh, aquaculture. She's also a scientific collaborator in the United States Antarctic Program, so studying the effect of climate change on the development of uh, Antarctic fish species. So, Nathalie, it's amazing to have you joining us from the C3 today. Merci. Je peux parler en français? Uh, myself, I should have taken it a little more in, uh, in school, unfortunately. Um, okay. But I would love I can, it. I can, okay, I, I can, uh, you want me to speak English or French now? Yeah, are you able to, in one of our past hangouts, uh, we kind of had a little bit of both. So I know the group in BC would probably like the English, but some of those walking by in the Museum of Nature might want a little bit of the French. Okay, so, uh, well, I don't know how to manage that, but uh, we'll figure something out. Okay. Okay. All right, so well. What do we... 
Yeah, so the group me sees saying more English, but some French is okay. Um, okay. But let's hear a little bit about you. What do you do and what are you up to on the C3? Uh, like you said before, I'm a researcher at the Biodome de Montréal, but I'm also an associate uh, professor at the Université de Rimouski, uh, at Université du Québec à Rimouski and Université Laval. I'm, uh, I did my studies in oceanography at Rimouski. And uh, yeah, I specialize in uh, fish physiology, uh, aquaculture, uh, physiology of conservation. Um, so on C3, I'm mostly uh, involved in collaboration with her. Her name is France Dufresne. She's a genetician at the, the Université du Québec à Rimouski. So here I'm collecting amphipods, uh, more specifically Gamarus oceanicus. Uh, she did past studies on, those, on that species, looking at the, the relative level of uh, biodiversity, the richness of the biodiversity within different population of Gammarus oceanicus, which is collecting over sample uh, in uh, many places. And uh, their result uh, showed uh, that uh, there were two distinct population of Gammarus oceanicus uh, in the north, uh, northern hemisphere. And um, this region here, Labrador and uh, Nunavut, has not been extensively uh, sampled. So uh, the, the, to say it very simple, simply is to see uh, to which uh, population the Labrador uh, samples we are taking belong to. There is two uh, distinct populations, like I said, one that is in Northern Europe and um, one that is uh, located in the south of uh, St. Lawrence. Um, based on glaciation events, uh, the, the, the population in the Arctic were decimated or dis um, how do you say this, uh, relocated because of the absence of a, of a viable environment for those species. So uh, since then, species have come back re-establish a population here in Labrador. So to which species, to which population does uh, the, the, the specimens we collect here belong to? That's one of the main questions. All right, so um, I know it's it must be pretty exciting to be sampling an area that uh, is very undersampled. So that must be an exciting part of, of this journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to link it to the global picture, that, that's the main objective, is to uh, fill a, a gap that we have actually in the data. So how long have so you been on the ship for? I was, uh, um, I, I came on board in Nain Labrador. We, we flew from Montreal to Kujuac, Kujuac to Nain, and then I boarded the Polar Prince um, with uh, high hopes and uh, very enthusiastic. And uh, now it's we're about uh, a day, a day from the end of this uh, journey, for me at least. And uh, well, I don't think we'll be sending anymore. So actually, I packed all of my gear today. Thing well, well packed. All right, so you get to relax a little and enjoy the sea ice flowing by. <laughs> Let's just say that. Yes. <laughs> all right. So um, I know people will be curious about, and I'm always fascinated about animal adaptations and especially adaptations to cold water or to cold temperatures. Um, mm -hmm. Can you share with us a little bit about some of the adaptations that maybe some Arctic species might have to help them survive in these cold waters? Well, we can talk about the ice fish in the Antarctic, which is a particularly cold environment. Perfect. And, uh, well, the ice fish are special fish uh, because they, they lack uh, hemoglobin. They don't have red blood cells. So uh, there's an issue there uh, in regard to sustaining life for them, being able to uh, move around and digest and reproduce. So uh, they are, as we could say, trapped in Antarctica water because they are so cold and well oxygenated. Because without red blood, red, red blood cells, you cannot uh, extract oxygen from uh, really, really efficiently. You can, but it's through passive diffusion and slow processes. So in cold water, that's the only place where you get those levels of oxygen that allows a fish without red blood cells to survive. 
and uh, that's um, a clear adaptation or would I say it, it is confined to this environment so uh, what it did to survive was to develop a huge heart this is a fish with a big heart and large gills and a lot of blood circulating uh, in in the So the in, in uh, limitation in terms of uh, and those fish limit that are still pretty active, as, but not as a similar species which would have retained capacity of synthesizing uh, red blood cells. This is a, this is a, one example of a, a well adapted both to cold water but to a mutation uh, in anywhere else in the world would have been uh, lethal. So this is a species then that would be particularly vulnerable to climate change uh, in the polar yeah. regions then. Yeah, that, but there's no ice fishes uh, in the Arctic. However, the same, uh, the same can be said about hypoxia and acidification, which affects both, both polar regions. But it's, a, it's, it's one of the models we chose to work on in the Antarctic because uh, it was uh, so vulnerable based on those uh, uh, physiological limitation, as we could uh, uh, qualify them, yeah. All right, well, before we jump to our groups, <clears throat> I can't help but notice your hat uh, from the Palmer uh, Station. Have you spent some time there? Three seasons over the, uh, in, in the Antarctic, uh, on the Antarctic Peninsula, yeah, with the USAP program, yeah. So how do you feel about living? So here is how do you feel about living uh, in the Antarctic? Did you, was it was it a big adjustment for you? Is it something you got used to? Well, you get used to <laughs> yes, but uh, it, it's very. Uh, I wasn't there a full year. I, I did uh, three years of, uh, of of staying over there. The the longest uh, part of a stay in Antarctica was six months. So uh, this was uh, particularly interesting. Uh, you get to know yourself. Uh, a lot, and uh, I developed social skills that I may uh, I did not have uh, as pronounced as that before. So I think uh, it helps uh, some people, and others can find it more difficult. But there's always a, a way out on the next ship or on the next plane. But uh, uh, for my for me, it was a very happy experience, and I'm looking forward going back in 2018 to continue our research program. Yeah. Excellent. Well, are you up for a couple questions? Yes, I'll do my best. Excellent. Well, let's check in with our group uh, at the museum first this time. Let me turn your microphone on. Oh, you did it for me? Excellent. How's it going? Hi. Great. So I'm going back to the question board. I have lots of fish questions still. And I understand Natalie studies fish, and she's an oceanographer and a fish scientist. Um, how do fish breathe? 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 Donc, euh, c est, c est, ces tissus-là sont ultra minces, à peu près une cellule d'épaisseur pour permettre au gaz, euh, l'oxygène et au, au gaz carbonique de s'échapper, donc euh, de s'échanger entre les deux milieux. Euh, donc, le, le, les globules rouges vont circuler dans ces tissus fins et translucides et bien, euh, et bien capter l'oxygène disponible dans le milieu, qui vont pouvoir redistribuer euh, par la circulation sanguine aux organes qui en ont besoin et vers le cœur nécessairement. Euh, on connaît des espèces qui euh, peuvent respirer par la peau, notamment euh, le poisson, euh, le grand gueule que je parlais tout à l'heure, des ice fish, où, euh, qui va avoir une certaine partie de sa respiration qui va pouvoir être prise en charge à travers sa peau. Donc, euh, ce n'est pas le, 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 le gros de la respiration qui s'effectue au niveau de sa peau, mais elle est tellement mince et euh, vascularisée euh, que les échanges gazeux peuvent également se faire dans un milieu pauvre en oxygène, peuvent être au niveau de la peau chez, chez certaines espèces, notamment le poisson des glaces. 
Merci. Merci. Um, another one that came up a couple times on our question board are why are whales so big? Why are <laughs> whales really? I mean, they're huge, right? And they eat some so quick. I, don't know. <laughs> I suppose. Uh, well, why dinosaurs were made so big? Uh, I guess there was plenty of food. <laughs> For first, but uh, I, I don't really have an answer for that. Uh, but I, the the, uh, the important thing is that uh, they are well adapted to the environment. Being in the water, I guess, being that big can be uh, can be uh, feasible um, without legs. <laughs> I think they develop capacity. Their their buoyancy uh, allows them to uh, be uh, able to navigate in the deeper waters and. Uh, come to surface to surface to breathe uh, I think they became that big because they could be and uh, uh, food uh, is plenty or used to be very plenty in the oceans to sustain such animals thank you is anybody in the water gallery want to ask a question to Natalie on the teaching boat I'm talking to you guys no no we, we seem to be hitting it. I'm just going to say we seem to be hitting at just the wrong time because while she was talking, I saw some people sitting, but it seems they disappear when the question part starts. Huh. Like people, like me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's go to our group in British Columbia and see uh, if the science camp students have some questions. So let me turn your microphone on. All right, guys, any questions about. Um, fish living in, in polar regions, about Nathalie's time on the C3. I do have a few questions from our campers here. So the first sure. is, have you seen a sunfish before? The sunfish, is it the mola mola? That's what they call yes. the mola mola? Oh yeah, the ocean sunfish? Yeah, I've, I've, seen, I've seen one uh, and we it was, uh, how do you say this? Uh, Naturalize. It's on display at Maurice La Montagne Institute in uh, Montjoly, Quebec, which is a fishery and ocean uh, institute. So it's available. If you guys ever pass through Montjoly, you can stop, and there's uh, an area open to the public where you can see a, a big mola mola on display. But I saw it. I saw it. When it was uh, naturalized. So it was. Uh, it was washed ashore. I think it experienced problems. Excellent, thank you. The next question we have is, what inspired you to be a biologist? Oh, I thought, uh, I think it was, uh, I always like to be outside. Um, I'm an oceanographer also, so you get to see, um, oceanographer get to do a lot of traveling, uh, manipulating uh, equipment, uh, large equipment, and uh, um, be on the field a lot. On, on boats and uh, I like uh, also the intellectual part of it but not a hundred percent so we get a nice mix of uh, of my interests at the time so um, I guess it's also because uh, I, lo I love animals uh, I had if I could I, ha I would have a, had a zoo in my room I was under control and I stuck with fish for a while so I had uh, two or three aquariums, and uh, well, naturally, it uh, directed me towards uh, oceanography and fish physiology. So. Uh, we have one more question here. Does anyone else have one? Yeah. Have you ever fallen in the water? Oh yes, <laughs> I have many from the fellow school. I'm not the only one. Uh, uh, yeah. I uh, did, and it was not a nice experience <laughs> because I'm specialized in, in cold water environment most of the time. And believe it or not, I jumped by myself in uh, minus eight, one point eight waters just to have fun with my friends while we were in Antarctica. There is this uh, ritual that when you're about to leave uh, and get on the next ship to set sail to to the continent from Antarctica. Uh, if there's someone you like very much on board that ship, we all put our bathing suits on and report to the dock 
And when the boat is left for a, a secure distance, we all jump in, in the Antarctic waters, and uh, we climb very rapidly back up and jump in the hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it's by accident, and sometimes it's uh, uh, very uh, voluntary. But that was something. I came from a minus 1.8 to, I think the bath was at 63. So uh, it was a shock, a temperature shock. Right. And we have, pictures. we have time for one more? Yes, I do. Um, um, I heard that the ice fish freezes solid when it gets really cold. Is that true? The ice fish? There's a possibility because the, the protection that the, what allows them not to freeze is the uh, antifreeze protein that are in their blood. They are produced by the liver uh, and part by the liver and they are released in the body fluids, but they, they will allow or enable the fish to sustain a certain coldness. Can we say that? Yeah. Um, and uh, it's based on what the fish should experience. So the seawater will never go higher than minus 1.8 most of the time, unless it freezes and then... So, like for the salmon, for example, it will freeze. Uh, it doesn't have any antifreeze protein. So at some point, it can freeze if the conditions are all uh, uh, assembled and uh, the, the, the conditions are right. But most of them will escape the area and uh, go to uh, uh, warmer waters and escape uh, freezing doing so. Uh, when you hear that fish freeze, I think it's when they are in sea cages, possibly for aquaculture growing. I know in the, at the, in the east coast of Canada, there are issues during uh, super cold events, uh, having their salmon froze because uh, the water temperature get too low and the fish could not escape. But most of the time, they can. And uh, I, don't, I think it, they can freeze like, like all mat biological material. But uh, most of the time in their environment, they won't. Uh, All right. Well, first of all, I want to thank our groups for joining in today, our group in British Columbia, uh, as well as our live setup at the Museum Hub, uh, at the Museum of, of Nature. Um, especially a really big thanks to Mark and Nathalie for joining us today from the C3 on leg number six. Um, oh, there's Mark coming back in. How's it going, Mark? Yeah. All good. Were you watching the sea ice pass you by? I was. I was trying not to fall into the frigid water. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Tempted for a swim? Not really. Okay. Fair enough. Well, again, uh, I can't thank you guys enough for hanging out with us today, for hanging out with our groups. Uh, this Hangout uh, will live online as well for a while, so other groups, as well as when kids get back to school September and October, they can catch up and see what the C3 was up to over the summer. Um, Nathalie, best of luck with your journey home. And Mark, I'm jealous of the, uh, the number of legs you have coming up. That's pretty awesome. Thank you. Nice to talk to you all. Yeah. All right. So cool. Maybe just before, Mark, if, if it's possible, just before we log out, can we take one more peek at the sea ice? Sure. <laughs> Here we go. Some nice while we were talking to Natalie. Hang we'll on, I'm just walking outside now. Yeah, we'll sign off with a view of what you're seeing. Just like those people in Vancouver, the ice is disappearing. Hang on a sec. Oh, look at that, right down there, right by the ship. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah, we did. It looks like it's breaking up pretty quick. See a little bit more. Fog. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there goes some uh, thick-billed mers flying out of the water. See those? Oh, that was cool. Wow. Did uh -huh. you see those thick-billed mers, the birds? I didn't see them. I'll have to look at the video one more time after we finish. All right. Well, well guys, that's what we're looking for. Pour it in the ice.
<laughs> Once again, thank you so much. Um, such an amazing uh, expedition, the C3. And I can't wait for our next hangout on Monday at uh, 1.30 Eastern. Great to talk to you. Bye-bye. All right. Again, thank you so much. And enjoy the rest of your day, guys. BC, Ottawa, thank you so much, guys. Let me turn the BC microphone on so you guys can be loud one more time. There they are. All right. All right. Have a good lunch, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.